Well, hey, friends, and happy Sunday. Welcome to South Point Church Online. Uh, This is quarantine Sunday number six, if you're keeping track. And at this point, I'm kind of getting used to this, right? There are parts of it that I kind of enjoy. Uh, But don't get me wrong, I would much rather be at the Lusby campus right now, partying with my people over there. And so if you're watching online and you're from the Lusby campus, let's put in the chat, you know, go Panthers for the the Patuxent High School Panthers. Uh, If you're a Leonardtown campus friend, let's cheer for Big Blue, go Raiders. We don't have sports right now. And so this is like the best thing that we got. Uh, And so let's encourage one another. Uh, Maybe you're not from a South Point campus. Maybe you're somewhere around the country or even stationed around the world. Uh, We're so thrilled uh, that you, you would be here today to spend part of your Sunday together. Uh, I don't know if you're losing track of days like I am. It was just last Sunday um, that we celebrated Easter, that Jesus is not on the cross. He's not in the tomb, um, but he is raised from the dead. He has conquered death and hell and the grave and given the victory uh, for you and for me. And so what's awesome is that 61 people can look to Easter 2020 And remember, that is the day that they put their faith and trust in Jesus. Uh, And when we add to that the week prior, 144 people in the last two weeks um, have become followers of Jesus, have crossed from death to life, and can now face whatever life throws their way um, because they know uh, that the source of life and purpose and peace with God is Jesus. And, And so... Wherever you are on the internet, let's give that a heart or a thumbs up or like a hallelujah hands, whatever it is that you want to do um, to just say, thank you, God, for doing what only you can do. So as we move into hearing uh, from God this morning, I want to let you know, hey, um, our our metrics tell us we have about 15 minutes before a Facebook notification or the buzzer on your your dryer goes off uh, and you get pulled back into the busyness of Sunday. And so I'm going to try to keep things short and simple. Before we jump in, I'm going to ask you to do something really simple. Just pull out a piece of paper, and you're going to write down uh, the answer to the question I'm about to ask. And you're going to want more time than 30 seconds, but I'm sorry, you can't hit pause. This is streaming right now. Um, And so just do the best you can, as fast as you can. You're going to answer this question. If you could experience or accomplish three things in your life, what would those three things be? I know it's super hard to answer that in 30 seconds, but ready, set, go. All right. Well, hey, time's up. Go ahead and put that to the side. We'll come back to that later. Hey, as I share today, I want to recognize that there are thousands of people watching. Um, and that means there are thousands of perspectives on how this pandemic has impacted you personally. Uh, and, and so um, today, as we look and we try to bring some perspective to this, I want you to know um, that we're not going to participate in what we call um, the the hardship Olympics. And, and that means we're not going to try to compare people's hurts and make one worse than the other. Now, of course, some things are more significant um, and, and longer lasting. Um, but the reality is for the eight-year-old girl who, who cried herself to sleep because she couldn't have her birthday party with her friends, um, that pain matters deeply to her. Um, for our, our friends who, who uh, were not able to have their wedding ceremony and had to either postpone it or stream it on Facebook Live, like that matters, right? That hurts. Um, for our friends who are serving in, in low-wage jobs um, to allow us to get the things that we need, I want to say thank you, um, and your pain matters. And, and then, of course, there are people who are dealing with a medical crisis right now and a health pandemic. Uh, and, and for those who have loved ones who are hurting right now, that pain obviously matters. God sees it. We see it. And so in no way, as we try to bring some positivity um, to what's going on, are we trying to minimize or lessen the hardship that you might be experiencing. Crisis brings out the worst in people. And so we've seen so many stories of greed and self-preservation and social Darwinism, uh, you know, as if a global health crisis and, and a financial uh, hardship isn't bad enough. Of, of course, there were natural disasters this week that came through the country. Um, there were accounts of women and children in vulnerable situations um, who are stuck and quarantined with their abusers. Um, there have been stories of, of racism and, and um, inequity 
uh, across the country as people uh, make this experience even harder uh, for certain friends. And so we are painfully aware of the brokenness of this world. Uh, on the other side, there's been some positive stories, right? I mean, maybe you saw that the, the cities in uh, India, they can see the Himalaya mountains for the first time in decades as the smog lifts. Um, animals are literally coming out of the woodwork all over the world. So there's some good things. I asked my Facebook friends, hey, what's one positive outcome um, that you've experienced from this uh, shutdown? And my friend Valerie um, shared about him getting to spend more quality time with her family. And I realize that's not everybody's story. Um, but Valerie says this, she says, I know I'm going to sound stupid, but I cried at Walmart this morning, like a lot. First I cried about paint and uh, craft supplies. Then I cried about books and puzzles, board games, playing cards. I even cried about exercise equipment. Needless to say, there were some very concerned looks as I wiped away the tears and stared at the empty shelves that were intended for barbells and yoga mats. The board games and, and cards, they're gone because families are playing together. Um, the paint supplies, they're gone because people are learning to creatively express themselves. Puzzles are gone because we're challenging our minds. Children's books are gone because parents and siblings are reading together. Exercise equipment gone because people are taking care of their physical health in their garage, outdoors, wherever they can. She said, I've never seen so many people walking, jogging, uh, and bicycling together. Entire families. So much sidewalk chalk. Every night around five o'clock, driveways are full of kids and their families playing together. She says, I played soccer with my son yesterday for the first time ever, and we're writing letters today to send to the great grandparents. All things that should have typically been a priority, but have not been, right? And, and so what's neat about Valerie's story is she didn't know what I was going to talk about today, but that last sentence is core to what I believe the message God has for us today. Um, her last sentence was, all things that should typically have been a priority, but have not been. So for all the pain and uncertainty and anxiety uh, of this last few weeks, there are some positives. Uh, Valerie in one sentence has summed up what many have felt, but few have said out loud uh, that, that this crisis is causing a heart check on our priorities. Uh, we've never experienced anything like this in our lifetime, right? And, and so it, it's affecting everyone, whether you're an entry level employee or the CEO, if you still have a job, congratulations, you work from home, Right. Uh, is your student, is your, is your kid a, an all-star athlete or a bench warmer? Doesn't matter. There are no spring sports, right? Do you have the biggest boat in the bay? You can look at it at the pier out your window, right? Uh, does your house look like it belongs in a Joanna Gaines magazine or do you live in the van down by the river? Doesn't matter. Nobody's coming over to party. And, and so this has shifted and, and this brought our way of life to a screeching halt. Whatever we've invested our time and energy and emotions and resources and honestly our purpose into is being pulled away for a season. And for some people, that loss of routine and frenetic movement and just constant go, 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 um, it's a really hard loss and it's sad and depressing, right? Uh, I, I saw it say, like, check on your extroverted friends. We are not okay. And that's so true. Like, I'm so done with being at home. Um, but here's the reality. Uh, when we stop and we get over the initial whiplash um, and shock of that hard stop, this break is giving rest to weary bodies, minds, and souls. It's giving rest that we desperately need. It's no secret um, that this American life is killing us, right? More than 50% of deaths are caused by heart disease, stroke, and suicide, all three things dramatically um, impacted by stress. Uh, our social media feeds reinforce the lies that, that our life won't be complete. And so we live in that house or drive that car or vacation at that resort or join this latest diet trend, right? It's always something else that's just out of reach that we have to chase after. Added to that pressure, um, what's happened over time is we've accumulated so many obligations and expectations and requirements by what we say yes to, 
right? And so we've said yes to the boss with the accelerated deadline. And um, we've said yes to the Boy Scouts who need a, a den master. We uh, said yes to the teacher that needs the chaperone. We've said yes to that friend um, who wants to have coffee or, or dinner. Um, we've said yes and yes and yes to good things. But those yeses have accumulated to a place that is unsustainable. Uh, a study was done of a thousand kids and they asked this question, um, if you were granted one wish that would change the way your mom and dad's work impacts your life, what would it be? And then another study asked the parents the same thing. What do you think your kids want from you as it relates to your work? Uh, and, and the answer is surprising because a majority of parents guessed, as, as you probably did, as I certainly did, that what kids want most from us um, is more time, right? We think our kids want more time. But, but the number one answer by a factor of almost two and a half, right? Two and a half times more kids said this um, than more time. And, and this was what they said. They wish that their parents, that mom and dad, were less stressed and less tired. So let that sink in for a minute. What your kids need from you is not necessarily more time. Um, it's, it's more time that is unhindered and undistracted. It's more of your presence, Right? And, and if I'm honest, I can be physically present, um, but emotionally checked out, right? And so I'm there in the room, but I'm scrolling my phone or I'm responding to emails or I'm managing somebody else's crisis. And so if we're unhappy, if our spouses are unhappy, if our kids are unhappy, if our employers knew how much uh, non-work related things that we, we do while we're in the office um, because our lives are so full, they would be unhappy, right? This isn't working. And so if it's not working for anybody, why do we keep living like this? Why do we keep doing this to ourselves? And is it possible that this break is actually a gift to hit the stop button, the pause button, and to clear the deck and to clear the board and to reset our lives and to start over? Because it might take weeks It'll probably take months. Um, but as, as the economic whirl of the world pumps back up, uh, the, demands on our expect, the demands and expectations um, are going to increase even more fast and furious to make up for lost time. And we get to choose what it is that we want to add back into our lives after this break. Uh, I'm making a prediction that the, the 2020 word of the year is going to be essential, right? We've heard that word a lot lately. Uh, essential workers, essential supplies, essential travel. Uh, all this week, uh, you know, the, the, the word essential brought back to me uh, a book that came out a few years ago by a guy named Greg McEwen, and it's called Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. And so um, it's kind of adjacent to, to the minimalism, right? Minimalism has been around for centuries um, and it pops up into pop culture every couple years in different ways. You might remember that last year, uh, Marie Kondo became a household name as people began to purge everything out of their house that didn't spark joy, right? Um, if you turn on the Discovery Channel or TLC or YouTube, you'll see a show about, you know, a couple that, that um, for their job, they, they knit um, kitten mittens and they sell them on Etsy and they live in a tiny house uh, in the outskirts in Montana, right? Or a family of five that live on a hundred things, including forks and knives uh, and um, rolls of toilet paper and number of shoes. Like it has to be a certain small amount. And sometimes when we hear those stories, it, it feels like it's just less for less sake, right? Like they're just trying to stick it to the man and show that they're different. But this idea of essentialism um, isn't just to prove a point. Uh, the the, the um, phrase that it comes to is less but better. And so it's not about getting rid of everything that wouldn't fit in a 10-foot U-Haul. It's about asking the question, what is a priority in my life? And do the things and the people and, and the situations around me um, demonstrate those priorities? So... Uh, back to the book, the phrase that stuck out to me from the essentialism, uh, and the reason I went back to it all these years later, um, it is this phrase uh, that whenever we get back to normal, we need to be able to figure out. And, and the phrase is this, if you don't prioritize your life, 
someone else will do it for you. I'll say it again. If you don't prioritize your life, someone else will do it for you. Uh, Over time, we have lost control. We've lost agency in our own stories. Uh, And we've handed over responsibility to whoever shouts the loudest, right? And so what happens is we've listened to all the advertisements and, and so now we've bought all the things. And, and so then we need a bigger house to fit in all the things. And um, I, I read that houses have tripled in size over the last 50 years. Uh, it also said that only 15%, one five, 15% of people who have a two car garage actually use it to park their cars in there, right? Because we have so much stuff that we have to move it out to the garage. Uh, in 1930, uh, it said that, that there were 30, the average person owned about 30 articles of clothing. And today, that number is 130 articles of clothing. But the thing is, we don't wear 80% of what we own. And so the reality is, almost 100 years later, we still actually wear the same number of things. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I am not against stuff. I am one of those guys that has uh, the two-car garage that's full of, of stuff, like, Stuff's great. But you know, I'm reminded of the, the great philosopher Brad Pitt who in, in Fight Club, uh, you'll remember said, the things that you own end up owning you. Or uh, Randy Alcorn says it this way. He says, every increased possession adds increased anxiety onto our life because we spend so much time maintaining, um, repairing, replacing our things, right? We have to mow the lawn. We have to do the laundry. Um, we have to fix the car. We have to worry about um, the kids breaking or scratching or losing our new phone, right? Every new possession brings with it a new anxiety. And so what happens is we add and we never subtract. And and over time, the dashboard of our life, uh, our time, our money, our stress, our worry meters are just redlined all the time. If you don't prioritize your life, someone else will do it for you. We, we've filled our lives with other people's priorities, other people's plans for our life without considering where it's leading us. Uh, and it's left us empty and stressed and frustrated. And so anti-capitalism isn't the word, right? Uh, what I'm going to share today is not 10 ways uh, to tidy up and to reorganize your life um, because this isn't a self-help issue. It's a heart issue. There's something broken within us um, that continues to, to add to our life until we are just full to the brim, um, but we lack purpose in our lives. And I want to suggest that um, the issue isn't, again, a self-help issue. It's much more sinister um, and insidious than that. I believe that there's an enemy of our souls that wants to uh, entertain us and distract us away from the purpose that God has for our lives. Uh, First John warns us of three great tempta- temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? What looks good, what feels good, and what makes other people impressed. And so um, don't get me wrong. If, if you've decided to follow Jesus, if you've checked the box and, and you've trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, like you're cleared to go, you're going to make it to heaven. Um, but I think many of us um, we'll miss out on the full life that God has for us, the abundant life that God has for us in the here and now. The Apostle Paul, who we're going to look at today, um, was familiar with investing his life into things that at the, at the end of the day didn't matter that much. Uh, and, and so Paul, before he was a follower of Jesus, was a Jewish religious leader, right? He was a follower of God for sure. Um, he did everything that was right. Uh, he did everything that was expected of him. And he, he um, uh, tried to do things to the best of his abilities. So we're going to pick up in Philippians chapter three. This is just one chapter before uh, where Matt's been in the Anxious for Nothing series. And, and in the beginning of the chapter, uh, Paul is sharing about how awesome and qualified and capable he is. Um, he is saying, hey, I have been there, done that, got the diploma and the t-shirt. He is a card-carrying member uh, of all the cool kid clubs. He was born to the right family. Um, He would be the employee of the month. Uh, He would be the HOA president, right? He's a big deal, and he has it all together. Um, But then he he pivots, and he changes directions in verse 7. 
and, it, and he says this, he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, right? Paul's life was heading in one direction, um, but then he encountered the risen Jesus. Uh, remember that whole Easter thing that just happened last week, right? Paul um, says he looked at his life and thought, man, maybe I'm not a big deal. Maybe Jesus is a big deal. Uh, and, and compared to rising from the dead uh, and kicking the devil's butt and becoming the way to peace with God, maybe being friends with Jesus is the most important thing. He says, for his sake, for Jesus' sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. See, Paul goes all in with Jesus uh, and he trades his wealth and his privilege and his leadership to follow Jesus. And he says, you know what? All that stuff behind me, it, it, it's trash. And the word he uses here is so harsh. It's almost a cuss word. Um, it's like almost out of toilet paper and you got to use mismatched socks, used up TP, garbage. It is trash. Whatever is behind me compared to Jesus, it is trash. Uh, and Paul is resetting his priorities. He says, I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. Uh, I become righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And that's the whole message of Easter, right? That, that our, our peace with God is dependent on the finished work of Jesus on the cross, not what we have done or do now or will do in the future for good or for bad. It is about what Jesus has done for us. Uh, verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him and share in his death so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. See, there's something about suffering. Uh, there's something about being humbled that, that makes us more like Jesus. When things don't go our way, when they're beyond our control and we choose to submit uh, and to persevere, that is the work of the spirit in you. That is the, the power of Jesus in us. And Paul says um, that, that he wants to suffer um, so that he can be like Jesus. And Paul, so you know, is like a gold medalist in suffering. Dude has been shipwrecked, uh, beaten, stoned, snake bitten, imprisoned. Like he has all the suffering merit badges. Uh, he says in verse 12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved this uh, or, or that I've already reached perfection but I press on to take hold of that perfection for which Christ Jesus has first taken hold of me. And, and so even Paul, who, let's be real, you and I, we've got nothing on this guy. Uh, if he would say he's still a work in progress, then, then give yourself some grace. Give yourself uh, some room. He says, I don't do it perfectly, uh, but I'm trying to pursue the purpose-filled life that Jesus died for me to have. And then here comes the key verse for this day. Then, and I think it points to this idea of prioritizing our own lives. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. You see, it's interesting that Paul would say one thing that he's focused on because our lives are so full and complex. There's no way that we could reduce it down to one thing. Um, but the word priority uh, came into the English language in, in the 1400s. Um, and for the first 500 years of, of the word priority, it meant one singular thing, right? The prior thing, the first thing, the one main thing. Uh, and it wasn't until the turn of the 20th century that we began to pluralize the word priorities as if you could have more than one most important thing. But Paul says, no, he's got one singular mission, forgetting what is behind him and pressing on to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us together. So friends, as we contextualize this into our own lives, the reality is, you know, you're probably not an apostle or a missionary or a church planter, um, but we all have been given this one life. 
We've all been given this invitation to follow Jesus and then to live out a mission to make him known. And it's a limited time offer, right? Because we've heard a lot about death rates recently, uh, but 100% of us are gonna die at some point. And, And we have one life and we get to choose how we're going to live it. And so as we press on towards the finish line, I want to ask you um, to take some time this week and to sit down with a pen and paper and and think uh, and reflect on your life before this thing happened, right? Before we got grounded and sent to our room for a couple months, what did your life look like? Uh, and, And was it the life that you wanted? And then ask the question, how can you narrow the gate as things begin to open up Um, How do we narrow the gate to what we begin to say yes to again? And I want want you to think in three categories. Uh, And if you were listening to one, I just lectured to you about one priority. I know I'm violating the intent, Um, but you know, we're not one dimensional. Uh, And and so I want you to prioritize in three categories. Um, First is spiritually, right? We got to put the first thing first. Um, If we're honest, we tend to stick faith kind of wherever it fits in at the end. Um, and I got to ask, how's that working out for you, right? I mean, you pray before you go to the doctor where you might get bad news or, or before you take that test you didn't study well for. Um, you come to church, you know, if uh, you don't have a tea time or the kids don't have travel ball or the Redskins are playing on Monday night, right? So we have to ask this question, how can I design my life in a way that puts Jesus at the center? Um, How can we be focused on knowing and loving God and being known and loved by God in return? And I said another way, how can you take your next spiritual step? Um, The second is relationally. And and the question for relationally is how can I prioritize the people that mean the most to me? How do we guard our yeses to the people around us that just want something from us um, so that we don't have to give all of our no's to the people that mean the most to us. Not all relationships are the same in value and importance. Uh, Some people give life and some people kind of suck energy. And we have to reserve ourselves for the relationships where we can give value and add value um, and have something left in the tank when we come home. Uh, Andy Stanley says it this way. He says, don't trade what's unique to you for something someone else will do. And the idea is this, that in every part of our life, everything we do, we're replaceable. Somebody can and will do what we do and often will do it better, right? And so um, for an employees, our, our boss will get new employees and somebody to do what we do. If we are the boss, our employees will get a new boss someday, right? Um, for my wife, she can get another husband. She can't get another first husband, but she can get another husband. But my kids... I'm the only dad they have. And so why would I trade um, the one thing that is unique to me for something that somebody else can and will do? And then lastly, practically speaking, the the, the bucket is just practical. And I wanted to add more categories, but the the truth is if everything is important, nothing is. And so we're going to go God first, people second, and then everything else. And so the reality is we spend a third of our life in our work, our, our vocation. And so um, you should put some thought to that about whether or not that's leading you where you want to go. Um, your kids' activities and hobbies and the things that we say yes to uh, relationally, our community engagement, whatever it is that fills up the calendar, right? We're going to ask that question. What is it that I'm going to allow to fill up my calendar? As opportunities come back into play, you get to choose what you say yes to. And so as we close, I want you to pull that list back out from the beginning um, of the three things you hope to experience or accomplish. And I'm going to bet that nobody wrote on there um, that we're going to buy a Tesla, right? We joke about that a lot here in the office because I don't know if a Tesla will make my life better. It'll certainly let me get there faster wherever I'm going, right? But I bet you you didn't write that. I bet you didn't write down that you're going to have the perfectly clean house. Um, I bet you didn't write that you were going to hit your third quarter sales goals, right? Because in the end, as we check our priorities, those aren't the things that lead us where we want to go. And yet those are the decisions um, that we often put first. And so we have to have a moment of honesty. 
uh, where we, we ask, are we living our life by design or default? Are, are, we, are we living a life that is centered on Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and on a mission um, to know him and to follow him? Or have we surrendered the outcome of our life uh, to other things, to the will and the whim of the people around us? If you don't prioritize your life, somebody else will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, that you're a God that didn't just rise from the grave uh, so that you could show that you're awesome, but that that resurrection power um, is is passed down to us um, so that we could live lives of significance, not for health and wealth, not for our own sake, but for the world around us. And so God, I pray that as we reflect on our lives and we think about what this shutdown has, has, has caused in our life and the things that have been pulled away, God, would you, uh, by your spirit, give us clarity of mind to be able to choose the things that we want to add back in? Would you give us the courage to put you first? Would you give us um, the obedience to put the people that matter most to us second? And then um, would you give us diligence as we, we add in all the other things that are important and valuable in our life, um, but do it with purpose and with a plan. We honor you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.